Okay. Well, ba basically, uh, yeah, folks, it's louder than you think. Um, this argument goes back, as I said, to the Middle Ages. And for philosophers, it's one of the more interesting arguments. And one of the most interesting things about it is it claims to be able to prove the existence of God from the mere concept of God. Uh, the other arguments, and we're not going to look at them now, but um, the other arguments like Aquinas' five ways, uh, versions of the, the first three are versions of the cosmological argument that claim uh, from the observation around us that things need a cause, that the entire cosmos needed a first cause and posits God as that first cause. Um, these arguments are what are called a posteriori. You see the word post there for after. Uh, basically, they're based on experience. Um, they, the argument is formulated after experience of the world and based on particular experiences. And um, the fifth way of Aquinas, which we will look at as a version of the design argument. But the ontological argument is different. It uh, is a priori, and that's a word that means prior to and independent of experience. So it's not based on sense observations about the world, but on the abstract concept of God. It's effectively an argument that claims that we can prove the existence of God the same way we would prove abstract things in mathematics, like uh, a geometric theorem. Um, that merely from the concept of God, we can prove it. Now, it's called the ontological argument from the word, Greek word ontos, which means existence or being. Ontology and philosophy is the study of being itself, of what Aristotle called being qua being. Um, and so, uh, well, basically, uh, uh, ontology is, is the study of existence, of being itself, right? So that's why we call this the ontological argument. Um, it takes its word from being. And so it moves as a premise from a concept of who God is, of God's being, to the conclusion that the being that fits the concept has to exist. So it's an argument that purports to prove with mathematical certainty the existence of God. And it's had several lives in the history of philosophy. Anselm formulated it in the Middle Ages, but um, was critiqued in his own time by some fellow monks. Descartes revised it a few hundred years later uh, in the late 1500s and then uh, or early 1600s, I forget when he exactly formulated it. But uh, Immanuel Kant in the 1800s criticized the argument, and we're going to look at Kant's critique of it later. Um, but the interesting thing is this argument that some people thought Immanuel Kant did in in the 19th century was revived because it was reformulated in a more technical way that got around Kant's criticisms in the middle of the 20th century. And so in the 1960s and 70s, there's a whole thing about whether this argument may work after all. Uh, that whole debate was reopened. You know, so 
sometimes philosophical debates have several lives. Well, if the argument goes from a concept of who God is, what's the concept we're working with here? Well, Anselm, and think about it, to a monotheist who believes that the whole universe was simply created by God and uh, were it not for God, the universe wouldn't even be here. Um, to, to a monotheist, who, who or what is greater than God, right? And, and so he works kind of from, from this observation, that God is a being than which none greater can be thought. In other words, we can't even think of a being greater than God. Now, in Anselm's time, and he's basically living in a Roman Catholic country, he can say that pretty much even a denier of God would agree on the basic concept of God. I mean, in that society, uh, even somebody who disagreed about whether God existed would still buy into the very traditional Christian Roman Catholic um, description of God. So he says, even the fool, now here he's not trying to be a name caller. He quotes a, a biblical verse, and I put the reference down at the bottom of the slide, that says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So the fool here is the denier of God's existence. But Anselm says, look, even somebody who denies the existence of God is going to still agree with me on the basic concept of who God is or would be if God existed. So what about that? Well, basically, Anselm is going to try to show that you cannot agree on the one hand that God is the greatest being we can think of or imagine. God is that than which none greater can be thought. And on the other hand, deny God's existence like the fool wants to do. So this raises a question, can we deny existence to a God who's such that none greater can be thought? Now this also um, lets you know the nature of this argument. It's an airtight deductive argument of the sort you find in mathematics, like in plane geometry. In that type of an argument, it's an absolute contradiction to claim that the premise or premises of the argument are true, but deny the truth of the conclusion if it's a valid deductive argument. Now, we, you know, any of you take logic from us? Some people do before they take intro. No, so we're not going to get too far afield there. But basically, Anselm says, no, you cannot even deny the existence of God as the greatest being you can think of without contradicting yourself. Folks, please, the cell phones, all, all of them out of sight. Okay. Uh, well, okay, if you're using it as a camera to take pictures. But re remember, these, these are in Blackboard. Uh, all right, so to move on. Think about it. What is somebody saying who does not believe in God, who denies God's existence? And that may be true of some of you. Uh, well, what's the claim of somebody who denies God's existence? Well, they're saying, okay, God exists in my mind, in our minds, as a concept, but God does not exist in reality. Now, here in the next slide, you see, and this is um, 
Anselm's actual illustration about this. You see him accept a platonic principle for, uh, for Plato to be greater also means a greater degree of existence. So um, he says, think of it in terms of a painting, right? Um, if the painting exists only in a concept in the mind of the painter, then that existence level is less than if the painter actually paints the painting and now that same painting exists not just as a concept in the painter's mind but in reality, right? So it's one thing for a painting to exist only as a concept, another for it to exist in reality and it's greater for the painting to exist in reality than just as a mental concept. So it's greater to exist in reality than only in the mind. So suppose that in which none greater could be thought existed only in the mind, then it wouldn't be the greatest being we could think of. We could think of a greater one, namely one that existed also in reality. But pretty much by hypothesis, we're working with the concept of the greatest being we can think of or imagine. So the bottom line here is in order to qualify as the greatest being we can imagine, since it's greater to exist in reality than just as a concept, then the greatest being we can think of, that in which none greater can be thought must exist in reality and not just as a mental concept, if it's indeed the greatest being we can think of. So you can see what's going on here. If you buy into the concept of God as the greatest possible being we can imagine, he's just showed you that God cannot qualify as that unless God exists actual, in actual reality. And so from the mere concept of God, as that in which none greater can be thought, we've just, he's just proved God's existence in reality. So God is that in which none greater can be thought, and so God must exist not only in the mind, but in reality as well, or we could think of a greater being, namely one in other words, if, if the, um, the fool, the denier of God, were right to say that the greatest being we can think of uh, exists only in the mind, then that wouldn't be the greatest being we could think of. We could think of a greater one, one that exists in reality. So, uh, you know, the fool utter has to admit that God exists in reality and not just as a concept in the mind or else basically contradict himself because if in order to qualify as that in which none greater can be thought, um, that being has to exist in reality, then you can't on the one hand say God would be that than which none greater can be thought, but God doesn't exist in reality. So the fool would contradict himself. Um, now, how could we reply to this? Um, first of all, there are two things you need to keep straight. It's one thing to either believe or not believe in God or in God. Okay, it's another thing entirely to accept or reject a particular argument or the claim of a particular argument to prove God. In other words, you could be a believer in God, but also think that a particular argument that somebody says proves God 
just does not do the job. And this is essentially um, the situation of Anselm's fellow monk, Guinillo, who presumably was just as devout a believer in God as Anselm. Guinillo, th these medieval scholastics extended Aristotelian logic significantly. And so they were crack logicians. And there's a technique that we sometimes teach people in logic called reputation by logical analogy. Not just analogy, but logical analogy. What do we mean? Well, the reason we can have a separate branch of philosophy called logic is because arguments are either good or bad uh, with respect to the actual form they take. And a good argument is a good argument no matter what it's about. So we can replace what an argument's about with variables like you did in a word problem in algebra and simply talk about the form of an argument and whether the form is a good form or not. And to refute somebody by logical analogy, you essentially try to create a parallel argument to the original one that either leads to an absurdity or outright falsity or even a contradiction. So Guinillo says, look, Anselm, I could use the same reasoning you're using to prove that the most perfect island, the greatest island we can think of or imagine, an island that's such that none greater can be thought, no greater island can be thought. Anselm, I can use your reasoning to prove that that island must actually be out there somewhere. Now think, or if you were going to talk about the greatest be island we could imagine, wouldn't, most of us would imagine some lush tropical paradise, right? And that's kind of what I got pictured. So he says, by the same reasoning, we could prove that the most perfect island has to exist. How? Well, in this roughly the same way. We would say, well, um, an island such that none greater island can be thought. The most perfect island can't exist just in the mind only, or it wouldn't qualify as the greatest island we could ever think of. So the most perfect island or the greatest island we could think of has to exist in reality besides it's just the concept of the mind. Now think about that. Isn't it odd to say that from mere thought, from mere abstract concepts, we could be able to prove that that island must be actually out there in reality. It, I say in this slide it seems odd that we should be able to prove that from mere thought. Um, and so we can say, look, rather than think from mere thought we can prove that the most perfect, <laughs> perfect island exists, why don't we instead question the reasoning that seems to give us that result. But, Guinillo went on to say, isn't that reasoning the same reasoning that Anselm is using in the ontological argument to prove God's existence? So you're saying, if there's something wrong with my perfect island argument, then there also should, should mm, should be something wrong with uh, Anselm's ontological argument. And that's why it's a criticism of the argument. Now, Anselm responded in a way that's a little unsatisfying, but he said basically the case of God's a unique case. Existence function, the existence 
where we're talking about a necessarily existing being. And remember, even in the Old Testament, right, Moses comes down, he's up there on the mountain, and he's saying, God, people are going to ask me down there when I come down, what's your name? Who's sent you all? Up there, and he says, uh, what, what is your name? And God says, uh, I am that I am. Tell him I am has sent you. In other words, that existence is a necessary part of God's, uh, you know, so, so he gets this from, from some biblical sources. So um, basically then what Anselm said is, look, the case of God is unique when we're talking about the existence of a necessary being. You can't compare it to the existence of a contingent created thing like a perfect island. Now, basically, Descartes goes and runs with this. Um, he tries to for reformulate the argument in ways that answer Guanillo, among other things. Uh, and there are reasons we'll see later when we look at Descartes why he needs an abstract proof of God. He can't use something like the design argument that depends on the world's existence because um, there are, uh, at this point, when Descartes formulates this argument, he's raised skeptical arguments about the existence of the world. So both Descartes and Anselm's version work from a concept of God. We saw that Anselm works with the concept of God as the greatest being we can think of or imagine as that in which none greater can be thought. Descartes works with a concept of God that's also in line with traditional theism, with traditional monotheistic theology. He works with a concept of God as the supremely perfect being. For Plato, nothing is more perfect than goodness itself the form of the good. Um, Augustine in the 400s AD said, no, we got to put Plato's forms in the mind of God because God is more perfect than any of Plato's forms and more fully existing. Uh, there's a problem with Plato saying the form of the good is, is the most fully existing thing. So anyway, moving along, Descartes works then with the concept of a being that has all perfections, all perfect qualities, because uh, this being, God, is a supremely perfect being. Now, there are certain things, and Plato, but mostly Aristotle, talked about essential properties of a thing versus just property something might have. In other words, think of it. It's not necessary that a triangle be any particular color to be a triangle. You know, the triangles illustrated here are like red, yellow, and black, right? But it's not necessary to a triangle that it be colored yellow or black. But, it is absolutely necessary to a triangle being what it is, being a triangle, that have three sides and three angles that add up to 180 degrees, like you saw it defined in plane geometry, right? In other, and so what Descartes is going to try to convince us of is that existence is so necessary to the concept of who God is, that it, it is in a way parallel to and, and as necessary part of who God is as having three sides and three angles are necessary to what a triangle is. So the idea is, is just as we can't think of a triangle without thinking of it as having three sides and three angles, we can't even think of God except as existing, is what he's trying to say. 
just as we can't think of a triangle without three angles. Move along. You can say, well, why is existence so essential to God? And here we get to the claim of God's being the supremely perfect being as part of God's essence, uh, what God is essentially. Descartes claims that existence is just another of the perfect qualities God has, of the perfections God has. Um, suppose we def try to define the supremely perfect being. Um, well, this is one reason why I think his version of the argument is a little more understandable. Suppose we set out the traditional attributes that theologians bring in when they're talking about God, the God of monotheism. God is all-powerful. That is, God is omnipotent, right? Omniscience. God knows everything, knows all. Omnipresence. God is everywhere. It's not that God gets around so fast in the universe, but that in a real sense, the universe is in God. Omnibenevolence, God is merciful and morally perfect. Now, Descartes would say, this description is good as far as it goes, but it's not a complete and adequate description of God as the supremely perfect being, because there's one very important perfection one very important perfect quality you're leaving out. And that for Descartes is what you see at the bottom of the second list. That is existence. So in order to claim that God is a supremely perfect being, you have to build into your, to your description of God that God is an existing being. Well, you can see what this does. If, if you then claim, if existence is a part of the description of God, you can see that you would contradict yourself to buy into that description and then at the same time deny God's existence. And this is where he's taken us. So he says, so completely does God, the supremely perfect being, exist that God can't even be thought of as not existing. And so the fool would contradict himself to claim that the supremely perfect being lacks existence. <clears throat> so likewise, with this argument, to buy the concept of God and yet deny God's existence would land you in contradictions. Another way you can summarize this argument, text I used to use it this way, God has all perfections. Uh, in the 20th century, they said God is the sum of all perfections, all perfect qualities. Existence is a perfection. Existence is a perfect quality. Therefore, God has existence or God exists. So, now, here again, Kant is a believer in, <coughs> in God from the German Lutheran tradition. But he believes that you can deny the existence of God without contradicting yourself. And this is a criticism it's a little technical. It makes a technical, logical point um, centering around what logicians call predication. Uh, suppose I said this coffee mug is white, right? I'm predicating whiteness of the coffee mug. In other words, to say that something has a particular quality is to predicate that quality of that thing. So here you've got the word predicate, but it's used in a very narrow technical sense, not in the broad sense 
that you were taught in English when you were taught that sentences have subject and predicates. Right here we're talking about a logical predicate. And so what Descartes does is make existence a logical predicate. Just one more property of God that can be predicated of God. Well, well, in other words, if you listed God's properties, God is all-knowing, all-powerful, God, exi God exists. Um, when I say God is omnipotent, I'm predicating omnipotence of God. But Descartes puts existence in that list. So if I say God exists, I'm predicating the property of existence to God. And what Immanuel Kant basically says is that's not how existence works and ought to work. Existence is not just another property of a thing. Consider this uh, slide with a car. I used to have a car that died, but it was... Suppose uh, somebody said, well, okay, what kind of car did you have? I said, well, it was a 2005 Chevy Aveo. It was blue. It existed. It had an automatic transmission, four doors. A you said, well, wait a second. Besides it's being blue and having an automatic transmission, you're saying it existed? It's something odd to list the properties of a thing and include existence in the list, even for ordinary things like a car. <clears throat> what Kant says is that a thing exists in reality is a precondition of its having any properties. In other words, for my car to be blue or to have four doors or any of its other properties, it has to first exist, right? And so existence for Kant then isn't just another quality in a thing's description. Now the reason this is a criticism is if we take existence out of the list of God's qualities, out of the description of God, then it becomes possible for us to deny existence to God without contradicting ourselves. Because we're not presupposing existence in the very concept of God as the most perfect being. And so this is his point. Kant says, or said in the 19th century, if we, we can describe a thing with all of its qualities and afterwards talk about whether the thing we just described exists or doesn't exist. In other words, we could describe Santa Claus with all his properties and then afterwards um, talk about whether Santa Claus exists. We could uh, describe Thomas Jefferson with all his qualities, red hair and all, and afterwards talk about whether he actually existed. Or, um, but existence is not a property of a thing. Now, how does this relate to denying the existence of something? Note, in this slide, there is no red sports car pictured. I deny existence to a red sports car in this slide. Kant says, when we deny existence of something, we reject the thing with all of its qualities. Right? In other words, there's no red sports car in the slide having any qualities at all. Red or anything else. Let's get back to what Descartes said about the triangle. Descartes says, look, we can't even conceive of a triangle without conceiving of it as having three sides and three angles. Right? But Kant says, look, I can deny the existence of a triangle.
right? I can say there's no triangle at all in this slide. And I reject it with all of its sides and all of its angles, and there's no contradiction to my saying there is no triangle in this slide. I'm not contradicting myself by doing that. And so Kant's point basically is if you take existence out of the list of God's qualities, God's properties, then we can describe God with all of God's other qualities and afterwards talk about whether the being we just described either exists or does not exist. And we can deny existence to God without falling into contradictions because we're not presupposing God's existence in its description of God that we're using. So, um, you know, this is basically Kant's point. Now, Kant himself is a believer in God, but as I said, he does not think that the ontological argument worked. Now, this argument was reformulated in the 20th century in a very technological version that got around Kant's criticisms that did not rely on treating existence as a quality, as a logical predicate. Um, we're, we're not going to talk about the 20th century criticism, but in the middle of the 20th century, it totally reopened the debate over whether this argument may be good after all.